Leviticus Part 8. We had just finished up with in the last lecture with um, God's commandments towards Israel regarding certain offerings and regarding what they were not to do when they come into the land which God was to give them for an inheritance and regarding redemption whether it be by jubilee or being redeemed by a brother and being told not to charge a brother usury or um, increase, in other words gain interest you might say and we had seen that the Lord had said you may take bondmen and bond servants of the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles means any people other than Israel. So this could be any people. It could be, um, if they were entering into the land of Canaan, then they could take Canaanites or Perizzites or Jebusites or whatever people they wished that sojourned with them or that they lived amongst God would order quite frankly that a lot of them be killed off because they had mixed with the second influx of Nephilim or they were doing abominable things uh, which God was very displeased with which is why they were spewed out of the land of Canaan but um, in reading certain verses of the Bible as I said in the last lecture there are some things which are kind of harsh to read but you have to realize that these were different times. It's not like it is now. Men did not know the freedoms that we have now. Nor did they cherish it as highly, even though they should have, having just no time come out of bondage themselves. But um, when understanding that the peoples were taken into bondage, or to slaves, uh, servants to Israel... Uh, they were of all different races, including other white people. They could have been Moabites, Ammonites. They could have been a lot of different peoples. The uh, slavery with regards to African Americans did not occur until uh, after Christ. Uh, some 1500 years after Christ, as a matter of fact. But um, recently, I've been getting a lot of comments on the Lost Tribes of Israel uh, documentary that I did, where people are writing me nasty little messages about the Lost Tribes of Israel because I state very clearly and unapologetically that Israel are Adamic, ruddy-complected people. And that is because that is what is written in the pages of the Bible. And anyone with any scholarly ability at all who goes into the Hebrew should be able to discern this. And then there should be no argument. But there is a latter-day um, doctrine or set of doctrines risen up lately that has led people to believe that Israel are of another race. Well, to, to, to put it as bluntly as possible, no matter whether it stings a little bit or not, they are incorrect. Israel are Adamic people, which means they are ruddy in color, just as Esau was. I already explained in the book of Genesis and in a number of studies, such as the seed of Edom, Israel, and mankind, and uh, the lost tribes of Israel, that... Uh, the Adamic peoples are, are, if you define them in Hebrew, they're basically made up of several words which connect together. Most of them meaning red or ruddy, ruddy complected. And uh, there are words H119 through H123 and H132. And H120, because it is utilized for mankind, and also for the man Adam, Eth Ha Adam, it confuses a lot of people as to what actual color Adam and Noah and, um, well, basically all the characters of the Bible uh, uh, of fame, including Christ himself, were. 
But uh, anyone with any scholarly ability who does any real study on it should be able to see that they were Adamic, ruddy complected. Uh, I've given several verses in, in accordance with this. Um, the ones that come to mind, 1 Samuel 16, 12, 1 Samuel 17, 42, Song of Solomon 5, 10, and Lamentations 4, 7. These all state that, uh, 1 Samuel states that David was ruddy and a fair countenance. And if you break the word back, it is ruddy. And it says ruddy as Edom or as Esau infant. Okay, well, Esau... His name means uh, Harry, but because he came out red, people automatically tend to think that uh, there's some kind of division in the races there when Esau and Jacob had the same mother and father. Therefore, they were the same race. They were both the definition of ruddy, which means to show red, as in to show blood in the face, to blush, and Esau came out red. This does not presuppose nor imply that he stayed red all of his life. In other words, he wasn't red like a devil with, with bright red scarlet skin walking around all of his life. It simply states that he came out red. And this was a sign of the people that he would become. The Edomites, called the Reds. They were called the Reds because the land of Edom was red. It was above the Red Sea where the Red Sea gets its name. They would become the Rosh. And eventually, the Rosh would translate to the Rus, who became the Russia, or the, Rus the Russian peoples. And Russian peoples today are Caucasoidal in color, just as are the tribes of Israel, which are their brother tribe. In other words, it can be argued that Esau is of Hebrew descent, because he was one of the children of Abraham, the first Hebrew, and Isaac, who was a Hebrew, so... If uh, Jacob and Esau are both the children of Isaac, then they are both of Hebrew descent. Uh, the word Hebrew got associated with the children of Israel more than it uh, did with the children of Edom. And the children of Esau were never really called by the name Hebrews, per se, in the Bible. But the children of Israel were called the Hebrews. And he Hebrew just means one that simply crossed over the water. One who crossed over the river Euphrates. In other words, Abraham crossed out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees, uh, out of Babylon, into the land of Canaan. In other words, he came out of Babylon. This is symbolic of man coming out of confusion, because that's what Babylon means. Uh, it was at the Tower of Babel that uh, the uh, men's tongues were divided and they could no longer understand each other and this caused confusion, which is why Babylon means one of two things in the Bible. It means the geographical location or it means confusion. So when you see the king of Babylon as Nebuchadnezzar, it was referring to the place. He was the king of that area. When you see the king of Babylon of the end times or mystery harlot, uh, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, it's referring to confusion. And I think I've explained that in a number of places. I have a number of studies on them, and there's no need to keep going with that. We're going to try to finish up this book of Leviticus today. And where we're going to begin in verse uh, or Leviticus chapter 26. And hopefully we will get through with this book. But I just wanted to point out, before we got going in this, that in the last lecture I had mentioned several things regarding the slavery of African Americans and the American Indian being um, taken from his lands. Things which I think in the uh, reality of things as far as righteousness and man's righteousness were wrong. Yet, they did have a positive outcome in the end. Because... Blacks now enjoy a higher standard of living than at any time in history. Some don't. Some choose not to. Uh, some would rather uh, be pandered to and take bribes to be pandered to. And this is not an insult against all people of the black race. But 
There are those who uh, allow themselves to be kept in servitude to uh, fat cat congressmen and senators who uh, give them entitlements and stuff. Gifts, you might say. So that they it kills their human spirit to strive to do better. And it, it kills their human spirit to strive and do better so much to the point till if others of them rise to the occasion and go to college whether their parents put them through college or whether they put themselves through college then they are referred to with derogatory names for being sellouts or uh, pawns of the white man and you know that is no way to treat someone who has made an accomplishment in a difficult situation but I'm not going to keep going on about this all day. There, there were uh, many races who were taken bond by the Israelites. And that's just the way it was. It was the times that they lived in. It was the rule of the times. There was nothing unusual about it. And that's the way it was. It wasn't just one race picked on or two races picked on or three races picked on. And uh, you can check out the word ethnos in Greek. Or the, the uh, word stranger from the Hebrew, and you'll find out it means a person who is not of Israel, a Gentile, in other words. Or the word heathen. It's uh, Heathen simply means a person who does not know of God, who does not understand God's laws, who does not adhere to God's laws, who is an uncivilized person. Um... Rome called the children of Israel on their migrations barbarians because they saw them as uncivilized. They saw them as Germanic tribal peoples and they called them barbarians. They called them vandals and that word is taken on a name uh, having to do with vandalism because the vandals often struck at night at Rome and uh, you know because they didn't like the Romans. But all this forms together. It's all part of God's plan. And like I said, sometimes some of the things that you read in the Bible are a little bit harsh to take, a little bit hard to swallow, and a little bit hard to understand. But we always have to realize that God is in control. He knows what he's doing. And that the outcome is that our souls are going to live with God eternally. And that this flesh age is just a little tiny blink of an eye by comparison to the life that we shall have of all eternity with God. So stop and think about these things when you when you consider them. And we're going to move on from this subject and get on with Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1 and we're going to be talking about false idols here and graven images. But before we do, let us go to the Father in prayer as always. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this day on bended knee and we ask you father to grant us wisdom and knowledge and understanding of these things written in your word though some of them be harsh to our human flesh and to how we look at things we know that you are the giver of all wisdom and all understanding and you have your reasons for the things you've accomplished therefore we come to you with open hearts and minds father and ask you to fill them with your wisdom that we may understand and know the truth of your plan and not think or look badly upon these events or these things that have happened in history because we know that you are on the throne and you are in control and we ask that you open the eyes and ears of those who study with us Father that they may receive the fountain of living waters and the pure undistilled truth from this, your word. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. So Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1. Ye shall make no idols nor grave an image, neither rear up or neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. In other words, you're not going to make any idol out of wood or stone or gold and molten or anything and rear it up and then fall and worship it. Verse 2. 
You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. And of course, his sanctuary is his house. I am the Lord. Verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, verse 4, I will give you the rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And we're talking about the former and the latter rain here. Verse 5. And your threshing shall reach unto vintage. In other words, your threshing floor is going to reach so high till you're going to have some to store back and it's going to become vintage. In other words, it's going to be from last year and the year before. And the vintage shall reach into the sowing time. In other words, you're going to have plenty to make it through. And you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. Verse 6. And I will give peace to the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. In other words, there's, there's not going to be war. And evil beasts here could have another connotation to it. It could, uh, you know, uh, be animals, but uh, also the giants. Anything, any uh, thing, we, it, it could even do with the governments that are in the land. The beasts in the Bible are very often symbolic of governments or political systems. Verse 7. Ye shall chase your enemies... And they shall fall before you by the sword. In other words, you're going to have the victory as long as God walks before you. Verse 8. And five of you shall chase an hundred. And a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. In other words, ten thousand to flee. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Now, we have a type here of the book of Revelation. What is the tongue of Christ? That sharp two-edged sword that swings both ways. The sword of the Lord. You can drop the S off of it. It is the word. See the spiritual connotations in these things. Verse 9. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. Now this doesn't mean God is a respecter of persons. There was the qualifier. If you do my commandments and do my will and respect my tabernacle, my house. So th this is not just going to be that this is just a given and it's a gift unto you. There is a qualifier. You have to earn it. Verse 10. And you shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. In other words, you're going to have plenty to store back. Verse 11. And I set my tabernacle, which, which is his house, among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Verse 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. Verse 13. I am the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. That ye should not be their bondman. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. In other words, when you wore a yoke you were burdened down and bent over. A yoke is a big, heavy wooden thing, often with metal um, chains on it, that you put your hands through, and it was uh, how a lot of slaves were transported. In other words, I've made you to walk upright, and not only upright, but upright in the Word. Upright through understanding by He gave the commandments. Verse 14. But, now there's, here's your qualifier. If you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these things, verse 15, and if you shall despise my statutes, or your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, verse 16, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, burning egg, and it shall consume the eyes, and cause sorrow of the heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Now, this is what happens any time a people turn their back on God. You shall sow your seeds, but others will eat it up. You will be consumed by terror and consumption. Think about America now. Being consumed with all the spending 
Americans being taxed for uh, crap, pork barrel, special interests, pandering. And you shall sow your seed. In other words, you'll go out and work in vain and your enemies shall reap the rewards of it. Does that sound like anything familiar? Verse 17. I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. And they that hate you shall reign over you. And ye shall flee from when none pursueth you. In other words, you're going to be afraid even when no one's pursuing you. Again, a lot of people will try to use some of these verses to say that uh, this has to do with other races being Israel, but and again, then again, when they do, they show that they're not very good scholars of God's word. Verse 18. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In other words, he's going to add seven times more to you. And I will break the pride of your power. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Think about that. If heaven is iron, then how are your uh, prayers going to get to the Father? It's just an analogy, Hebraism. And your earth shall be like brass. In other words, when you go to till the field, it's going to be rock hard. God can cause it not to rain, and the ground will harden up. Verse 20. And your strength shall be spent in vain, and your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Verse 21. And if you walk contrary to me, I will not hark and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues on you according to your sins. And we know that God is capable of bringing plagues. Remember Egypt. Verse 22. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number. And your highways shall be desolate. Now, this beast here, again, uh, in these times, could be literal beasts, even giants. But, I, but in our time, it can be powers in government, which shall rob your children of you. Uh, maybe they won't take your children from your, you literally, but they'll rob your children. Or maybe they will take your children from you literally by not uh, putting people in jail who kill people so that they go up and shoot up elementary schools. Instead, they'll blame the gun. No, it's the gun that did it, not the, not the person who did it, not the criminal with the gun in his hand. He was mistreated. We must understand his pain. It was the gun that caused him to do it. If he hadn't had the gun, he couldn't have done it. Well, sure. I mean, after all, men have only killed each other for centuries with uh, bows and arrows and uh, swords and staves and stones and uh, pieces of wood. I mean, you know, if man has the desire to murder in his heart, taking guns away is not going to stop him. As a matter of fact, taking guns away is going to encourage him. Because if you walk down the street at night and you're not sure if someone has a weapon or not, then you're not likely to try to rob them. Because they might blow your head off. But there are some in this country who are too childish minded to understand that simple premise. And they do things by feel good politics. Let's do things that make us feel good. Let's protect the children by getting rid of guns. Well, it, you know, the old saying is true. When you outlaw guns, only outlaws will have guns. And when only outlaws have guns, then guess what? You're a sitting duck. You're going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. Verse 23. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, in other words, by the things I send, uh, send upon you, but will walk contrary unto me, verse 24, then I will also walk contrary unto you and will punish you seven times for your sins. Yet seven times for your sins. In other words, he's going to pour on even more. Verse 25. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. In other words, that you have transgressed. 
And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And guess what? These things did happen to Israel in the future sense, with the uh, king of Babylon, with the king of Assyria, with Rome. Because the children of Israel walked contrary to God. They started worshiping idols, and they did man-pleasing things. In other words, they uh, the priests taught men's doctrines for the doctrines of God and held to the traditions of the elders. So much so that when Christ came, they even reviled him for healing on the Sabbath day. For doing a work of God on the Sabbath day, they called him a heretic. And they were supposed to be the representatives of God. Verse 26. And, and really nothing has changed. Verse 26. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall break your, bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat it and not be satisfied. In other words, ten women are going to bake in one oven. Instead of ten women having an oven each of their own. And there's not going to be enough bread that you shall eat and be filled. In other words, you're not going to be satisfied. And this has to do, in a, in a deeper sense, with uh, your money is not going to be worth what it was. Your shopping cart's not going to be as filled, yet you're going to spend more money. Your basket's not going to be as filled, yet you're going to spend more money. Think about it. Verse 27. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you also in fury. That means rage and anger. And I will chastise, I, even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now, that, that's a lot of sevens there. That's 7, 14, 21. We're getting on up there now where God is going to get through to you one way or the other. Verse 29. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. Now, this has a connotation to it of being that hungry that you would do that, but uh, really this has to do with uh, what's written in... Um, well, I can't think of the verse right off the bat here, but... Um, the father shall betray the son up to death, and the mother shall betray the daughter, and so on. In other words, if you walk contrary to God, and you're not in his word, then you're in deception. You're in darkness. You're in confusion. And many people in confusion are going to deliver their children up to death, and their children are going to deliver them up to death. And not only that, we see a type of this now with parents killing their children and children killing their parents and children killing other children. These things didn't happen uh, not so long ago. When I went to school, you could go to school and you didn't have to worry about somebody coming in and killing you. And it wasn't because of guns. There were guns around back then. There have been guns around for uh, three, four hundred years now. Maybe longer. With the, with the very first guns, flintlocks and muskets and what have you. What because of the gun? Verse 30. And I will destroy your high places. That means your places of worship. And cut down your images. And cast down your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. In other words, my soul shall hate you. Verse 31, And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. Read it. And I will not smell the sweet savor of odors. In other words, I won't accept your offerings. Verse 32, And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. In other words, they're going to be astonished it, it, it's what, it, what's happening to you, the people of God. And you know what? 
There are probably people in other lands astonished at what's happening to the Christian United States of America, one nation under God, right now with all the secularism and all the socialism being pushed upon it. Verse 33, And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out the sword after you, and your land shall be desolate in your city's waste. Uh, what happened to Israel? They were scattered among the heathen. They were dispersed. Diaspora in the Hebrew. Verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate. In other words, the land Sabbaths. In other words, we covered the land would be at rest earlier. Well, it's going to be at rest now because there's going to be nobody to work. It's, it's desolate. And ye be in your enemy's land, and then the land shall rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. Verse 35. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. In other words, you worked the land, you brought forth fruit. Verse 36. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send faintness into your hearts in the land of your enemies. And the sound of the uh, shaken leaf shall chase them. In other words, just the sound of a little leaf shaken one against another is going to cause them to run. In other words, they're going to be that uncertain. And they shall flee as fleeing from the sword. And they shall fall when none pursueth. In other words, they're going to be so scared, they're going to fall. They're going to be running and not looking where they're running and trip over a rock or run into a tree when no one was even pursuing them. They're going to be that afraid. Verse 37. And they shall fall one upon another as if it were before the sword or before a sword when none pursueth. And ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And again, people will try to use these verses to imply things about other races and and, and draw similitudes to them, which, which have no article amongst the races they're talking about. And uh, as a dear pastor that I've studied with many years has said, just winning friends and influencing people here. But, um, you know, this is the truth. You're going to have no power to stand before your enemies. Well, look what happened when Babylon overcame um, Zedekiah. He killed all his male heirs and plucked out his eyes, and he died in Babylon. In other words, he died in confusion and in the land of Babylon. And his people were dispersed to the four corners of the earth. Verse 38. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall you eat up. And this doesn't mean you're going to eat up their land as far as you're going to do like they've been doing you. It means you're going to be going into their land, fleeing for your life, and uh, moving from place to place. In other words, you're going to go the breadth of it, eating it up. Verse 39. And they that are left of you shall pine away. That means depressed. Be depressed in their iniquity. In your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquity of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Verse 40. If they confess their iniquity and their iniquity of their fathers and their trespass which they have trespassed against me and also that they have walked contrary to me Verse 41, And that also I have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts, not their foreskins or flesh, but their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, in other words, they have a change of heart, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, and, uh, in other words, kiss the paddle, buddy, you deserved it. Verse 42, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, and I will remember the land. 
verse 43. And the land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths, while she lieth deathless without them. And they shall accept the punishment of their iniquity, because, even because, they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Be very good if a number of senators and congressmen and uh, presidents could hear these words and turn from their ways. Why do you suppose the country is in such bad shape now, this one nation under God? Verse 44. And yet for all that, when they be found in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. In other words, God would never totally forget them and destroy them utterly. He will leave a remnant. Verse 45, And from that remnant would grow the people again, as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Verse 45, But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Verse 46, These are my statutes and judgments and laws, which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Leviticus chapter 27, the last chapter of this book, and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a vow, or a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord, by thy estimation. In other words, when you make a vow to the Lord, uh, it, it, it's going to be by the uh, be for the Lord by estimation, and it's going to explain verse three. And thy estimation shall be of the male, from twenty years old even unto sixty years old. Even thy estimation be fifty shekels of silver, after the shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 4. And if it be a female, then the estimation shall be 30 shekels. Verse 5. And if it be from 5 years old, even unto 20 years old, then the estimation of the male shall be 20 shekels. And for the female, 10 shekels. Verse 6. And it be from a month old, even unto 5 years old, then the estimation of the male shall be 5 shekels of silver. And for the female, thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. Verse 7. And the reason, of course, for this is uh, the male is stronger than the female uh, physically. I, I realize there are women that go off to war and go into the military, and God bless them, but um, the male frame and the male is stronger. Uh, w women more often have a stronger will than men. And uh, this is not to say they cannot be a fine frontline soldier and all of that, but um, this is according to the view of the time. Verse 7. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for, ten, and for female, 10 shekels. Verse 8. But if he be poorer than thy estimation... Then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him according to his ability that he vowed to the priest to value him. In other words, all of this that we're talking about is how much they have to pay in. In other words, this is what they're going to owe. Verse 9. And if it be a beast whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such to the Lord shall be holy. Verse 10. He shall not alter it. That means he shall not change it. Well, it says right here, not, nor change it. A good for a bad. Or a bad for a good. If he shall eat at all, change beast for beast. Or if he 
shall at all change beast for beast, then the exchange thereof shall be holy. Verse 11. And if it be any unclean beast, of which they do not offer sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest, verse 12, and the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou valuest it, who are the pre who art the priest, so shall it be. In other words, the priest will be the one to estimate the value of it. Verse thirteen. But if he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part thereof to thy estimation. Verse fourteen. In other words, if the beast is found to be acceptable. Verse fourteen. And when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad. As the priest estimate it, so shall it stand. In other words, by the priest's decision. Verse 15. And if he sanctified it, it will redeem his house. Then he shall add a fifth part to the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. Verse 16. And if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of a field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof, and homer of barley, seed shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver. Now a lot of people uh, in, in olden times during the Spanish Inquisition and stuff would use verses like this to take land from people. And if they didn't, uh, fork over their land, then they accused them of having devils or being witches or being in the some kind of coven or being filled with an evil spirit, and then they would torture them, and uh, because they couldn't put someone to death without a uh, confession, so they would torture them until they confessed, and of course anybody, when they're tortured enough, will confess just to get out of pain, and once they confessed and were killed, then the church would take the land. And this this has got uh, Cain's fingerprints written all over it, and I have a study called Cain's Fingerprints on this very subject. Uh, he shall sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to thy estimation it shall stand. Verse 18. But if he sanctify his field after Jubilee... Then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of Jubilee, and it shall stand abated from thy estimation. In other words, it's not going to be held to the estimation. Verse 19. And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he will add a fifth part of money to thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. In other words, uh, redeem means to uh, possess or to buy, or to buy back. Verse 20. And if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. Verse 21. But the field, when it goeth out in the jubilee, shall be holy unto the Lord, as a field devoted, the possession thereof shall be the priest's. And again, some used these verses and twisted them to make a means what I was explaining before during the Spanish Inquisition and such other things. Verse 22. If a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath brought, which is not, uh, which is not of the fields of his own possession or of his possession, verse 23, then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even unto the year of Jubilee, and he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. Verse 24. In the year of Jubilee, the field shall return unto him who it was brought, even to him whom the possession of the land did belong. In other words, the original owner. Verse 25. And all the estimations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, Twenty geras shall be the shekel. Verse six, or twenty-six. Only the firstling of the beasts, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep. It is the Lord's. Verse twenty-seven. 
And if it be unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation, and add the fifth part thereunto. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to thy estimation. In other words, if the guy doesn't want to buy it back, then it shall be sold for the estimated worth of it. Verse 28. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that man shall devote unto the Lord, of all he hath, both man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. Verse 29. No devote, or none devoted which shall be devoted to men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And this, of course, is speaking of the animals. Verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or of fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And this is the uh, second time in the Word of God we see the word tithe mentioned, which means a tenth, a tenth part. For the first time uh, when uh, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, verse 31. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereunto the fifth part thereof. Verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd, or of the flock, or even whatsoever passeth under the rod, in other words, the rod was what they, uh, the animals passed under. You can remember this from Genesis with Jacob. The tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. In other words, the tenth animal. Uh, verse 33. And he shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy, and it shall not be redeemed. In other words, because it is the Lord's. Verse 34. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. And this completes the book of Leviticus. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this book. Some of it's a little bit hard to understand. And uh, you may have noticed, I do this from time to time when I'm doing these books. I will not define every word for you. I will define some that are important, some that uh, are on a deeper spiritual level. But uh, as a teacher of God's Word, I expect you to be able to go in and look certain of these things up yourself, if nothing more than to get you interested in the study of your Father's Word. Therefore, from time to time, I will leave words that uh, are spoken without explanation for you to go look up. And my aim in doing that is to try to get you into your Father's Word. Uh, you should already be in your Father's Word because I know there are probably many of you out there who um, disagree with the things that I say and the things that I teach for one reason or another. There are many denominations in the body of Christianity and um, people don't all believe the same way. But I'm non-denominational I don't uh, teach by any certain denomination's doctrine. I did not graduate from any seminary school or any Bible college. And uh, I expect you to go and check out these things and look for yourself. That's the only way you can learn. I mean, I could sit here all day and tell you this, that, and the other, but if you don't go and check it out and look for yourself then how are you ever going to really know? So many people do not do this. So many people will go and attend a church and believe whatever is said. Or they will sit in a Bible study group and believe whatever is said. But they won't pick up a Strong's Concordance or a Green's Interlinear or a Smith's Bible Dictionary or a um, Companion Bible. Nine times out of ten, they probably won't even... Uh, pick up the Bible itself except to look at a few verses as they're yawning their way through Bible study or sitting in church 
not being fed because the people that are there to be priests over them and to teach them really uh, may not be qualified to teach the Word of God. They may have a doctorate or a uh, certificate of divinity or something from a Bible seminary college, a piece of paper saying that, yes, this is a pastor, yes, this is a priest, but that does not presuppose that uh, they are. They may be one on paper. I know many that are priests on paper that would, uh, as a matter of fact, if I were to go into uh, any of the churches that I visited in my lifetime and, and a couple that I grew up in and uh, start teaching these things against the rapture and the coming of Antichrist and things like this, I'd be kicked out on my can so fast it'd make my head spin. So it's not what a piece of paper says. It's what you are willing to do. Study to show yourself approved. I liken the Bible to a complex mathematical problem. And if you, the teacher writes this complex mathematical problem ten places on a chalkboard and ten different students get up and work the problem uh, assuming they don't look at each other's work and cheat, then they should all come up with the same answer. And if they don't come up with the same answer, then somebody did their math wrong. But they should not be allowed to say, well, that's my interpretation of how that math is to be done. Because math doesn't work like that, and neither does the Word of God. Now, there are some things that God will give some that he will not give others. And there are some things that God will give lesser portions of for reasons of his own understanding and of his own will. But you cannot take things in the Bible and twist them to fit your own agenda and your own doctrine. And that's what many do. And, and, and as they do this, many of them even accuse me of doing it. But the ones that accuse me of this seem to have trouble answering the questions I put forth to them. Either that or they will try to twist a verse and contort it to fit in English like it sounds like it's an answer to what I ask them. But if they go into the Hebrew or the Greek, they will find out it's not what they thought it was. I've had that happen a number of times and I'm not saying that I'm an expert on the Word of God. No man can know every bit of the Word of God and understand fully and comprehend everything and every little nuance of the Word of God. But you can get what God will give you of it and you can ask Him for wisdom and understanding and revelation in it. And from that point on, it is, choice. It is His choice as to what He will feed you with. At any rate, I hope you've enjoyed this book of Leviticus. It's been a little bit difficult. There are portions of it, like I said, which are harder than others. But uh, I hope it has enriched you and helped you to understand a little bit better. I thank God for this um, platform where I can share with you these studies and the knowledge that I have learned from many gifted pastors and from a lot of elbow grease in the Hebrew and Greek and personal study. But may our Father keep you from the hour of temptation and deliver you from the evil which is soon upon us and keep you in the promised land of the truth of his word. And may our Father bless you as you study his word earnestly, diligently, with an open mind, an open heart, and an objective sensibility, that you listen and that you study to show yourself approved. You can listen to anyone. You can listen to any man, any preacher, any teacher. But don't simply take their word for it. Not mine, 
not anybody's. Study for yourself. That is the only way you can learn. And if you don't do it, you have no one to blame but yourself. I hope you will not be one of those that feel shame and blame when the great and terrible and notable day of the Lord comes. And it's revealed that people have been worshipping a false Christ because they didn't take time to study their father's word because American Idol was on or NASCAR was on or Monday Night Football was on or any of a hundred other shows or, or they were on Facebook or any other thing, e even YouTube. That's one of the reasons I chose to put studies on YouTube to try to bring a little light to YouTube amongst all the filth and conspiracy and lies and unregulated uh, dung that's on it. At any rate, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.